on climate change, President Obama is taking our country in an entirely new direction, which I trust our friends in Europe will appreciate. We are pursuing a global strategy to combat climate change through the offices of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and that negotiation process in Copenhagen, the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate, and key bilateral relations. In the joint summit declaration released last week, the US and the EU agreed, quote, to promote an ambitious and comprehensive international climate change agreement, agreement in Copenhagen. So we look forward to that. <coughs> On our part, acting in his capacity in the executive branch, the president has increased fuel efficiency standards. He has provided new incentives for conservation so we have higher standards now for fuel efficiency in autos, higher standards for appliances and electricity consumption and that sort of thing. In addition, uh, country companies in the United States will now have to report their greenhouse gas emissions to the EPA, companies of a certain size. These are all new steps that we've taken unilaterally through the administration. In addition, the economic stimulus package that the president uh, was able to get approval for this year uh, spends $80 billion on clean energy technology through the Department of Energy. Let me repeat, $80 billion. As a longtime investment executive, I can assure you that the promise of green technology is exciting the American business community and entrepreneur community. Uh, the venture capital money in the United States is flowing into green technology. In fact, uh, really predating the president, but in anticipation of something like this, the, the business community, uh, many communities across the United States have invested in environmentally friendly technologies and approaches, and you know, in effect, not waiting for the government to uh, put a cap on carbon, uh, expecting it to come. And lastly, but certainly not least, the president himself told the UN General Assembly that the United States has, quote, re-engaged the United Nations. We have paid our bills. We have joined the Human Rights Council. President Obama, by the way, was the first United States president ever to address, to chair a session of the UN Security Council. He presided over the unanimous passage of a resolution that set forth a robust non-proliferation and arms control agenda. Now, this is a first. And it shows how committed the president is to working through multilateral organizations. I know Austria is doing its part serving on the UN Security Council. And indeed, I congratulate Austria on chairing the council this month. I hope you can agree with me that the initiatives and actions that I've outlined represent an impressive beginning. In speaking at the UN, the president said something else that bears repeating, and I quote, those who used to chastise America for acting alone in the world cannot now stand by and wait for America to solve the world's problems alone. We have sought in word and deed a new era of engagement with the world. And now it is time for all of us to take our share of responsibility for a global response to global challenges." End quote. In short, the Obama administration understands full well that the United States cannot deal with these and other challenges alone. And I think most Americans support the President's view. Moreover, as my country surveys the world and looks for partners to help us deal with these large challenges, we find Europe and the European Union to be absolutely essential. Indeed, as our Assistant Secretary for Europe and Eurasia said in Brussels just a couple of weeks ago, America needs strong partners and, quote, we want to take the partnership with Europe to a particular new level. Let's look at some areas where the United States needs strong partners and where the world needs the U.S. to have strong partners. Consider Afghanistan. The media usually focuses on the military operations there. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that the UN mission in Afghanistan represents a major international effort. 
Its aim is not only to improve governance and the rule of law and to promote human rights, but also support relief, recovery, reconstruction, and development activities. Helping the Afghans to implement the 2001 Bonn Agreement and the 2006 Afghanistan Compact is one of the central challenges of our time today. European partners are providing <clears throat> significant assistance in many civilian sectors. On the security side, there are some 100,000 non-Afghan forces in the country right now, of which roughly 40% are non-American. European nations have committed more than 30,000 troops there, and the United States appreciates this very significant commitment. As you know, President Obama and his advisors have been engaged in a thorough review of our strategy in Afghanistan, and those decisions will shape how we engage with our partners to address this difficult challenge going forward. It's worth noting that Russia supports this international effort in Afghanistan, not just via the UN mission, but also by permitting NATO to fly troops and material across Russian airspace. It's easy to argue that Afghanistan is far away and someone else's problem. But the threat from Afghanistan, as we have seen in terrorist incidents in Europe, is as much a threat to Europeans as it is to the United States. Taliban extremists are essentially an Islamic brand, or at least they call themselves Islamic, of fascism, threatening not only traditional Muslims and others in Afghanistan, as well as stability in neighboring countries like Pakistan, but threatening humanistic values, period. The world learned in the 1930s the terrible cost of being slow to react to extremism and persecution, and we should not make that mistake again. Put another way, this is not just America's war or America's challenge. It is a collective challenge that we need to tackle together. In this regard, I welcome Foreign Minister Spindelegger's assertion recently about Afghanistan, published in a magazine interview, that Austrians, quote, have to understand that the situation there also concerns us, end quote. So might Austria contribute here in other ways? There are a range of development and security needs in Afghanistan. Austrian know-how doubtless could address one or more of them. As I mentioned, development, governance, rule of law are key sectors in need of support. The United States would welcome such a commitment by Austria, as would our other partners in Afghanistan, and not to mention the people of Afghanistan itself. Iran is another mutual challenge for Europe and the United States. So it is important that Europe and the United States continue to work together to ensure that Iran's nuclear program is a peaceful one, as it asserts. Again, U.S. engagement in speaking directly with Iran underscores the Obama administration's willingness to go the extra mile to address this issue. In a message on the 30th anniversary of the seizure of our embassy, in Iran, in, in Tehran, President Obama noted that that event set our two nations on a path of suspicion and confrontation. He made clear that the United States has recognized Iran's international right to peaceful nuclear power. He also stressed that we want to move beyond the past and that we seek a, quote, relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran based upon mutual interests and mutual respect. Quote. This does not mean that we will not speak out for the human rights of the Iranian people, nor will we ignore the danger of Iran developing nuclear weapons. But we recognize that if Iran becomes a responsible participant in the global community, its long-suffering people will have a better future. 